Today on The Serial Port, we're checking out multimedia and we're not talking about CD-ROMs, but the original multimedia. We'll be looking at the Cabletron Multimedia Access Center, a chassis-based hub that came onto the scene in 1988. We'll try to get one working and see if we can discover the magic of early 90s networking. If you haven't heard of Cabletron, that wouldn't be surprising, as they haven't been around for a couple of decades. They had their start though back in the 80s specializing in 10 base 5 Ethernet, or what was called ThickNet, a reference to the large and inflexible cabling that standard used. Cabletron grew to have a huge presence throughout the 90s, and were part of what was called the Big Four in networking, along with 3Com, Cisco, and Bay Networks. The Multimedia Access Center, or MMAC, was introduced in 1988 when Ethernet did not have the dominance it does today. Through the early to mid 90s, it was common for college campuses and businesses to employ several different networking technologies like Token Ring, FDDI, and Ethernet in thin net, thick net, and twisted pair varieties. And typically, you would need separate devices for these different interfaces, but that's where the Multimedia and MMAC comes in. Its form factor allows you to mix and match modules for different interfaces and protocols as you needed, and they could all coexist in the same hub. The MMAC was flexible in that it could be deployed in many different scenarios, including using a multi-port router to interconnect the different networks. We have four MMAC chassis that we'll be looking at, two three-slot and two eight-slot units. The first thing we noticed about these units after receiving them is how surprisingly lightweight they are. This eight slot chassis with one power supply weighs approximately 20 pounds. Meanwhile, this newer six slot Cisco Catalyst 6500 with no power supplies weighs a whopping 50 pounds. We're first going to check out the three slot units called the MMAC-3FNB with FNB an acronym for Flexible Network Bus. One doesn't power on at all, and it's in questionable condition. But the other unit does power on, although... <laughs> Along with the chassis, we've also got two management cards, an IRM and IRM2, as well as 10 base t and 10 base 2 interface cards, the latter of which has some blown tantalums. We first want to connect to the management cards as they contain the onboard software that we access through the console ports. Before we can dig into these though, we need to make a serial cable. So first up is the original IRM, which stood for Intelligent Repeater Module. It has a ton of corrosion from this leaking nickel cadmium battery. We removed the battery and cleaned up the card to get a look at the condition of the PCB underneath. And it's actually not too bad. There's obviously a lot of corrosion still left, but none of the traces that we tested were broken. So let's give it a shot. And immediately we get this fail LED and nothing from the serial output. We checked the power supply voltages, of course, and they all look good. So it's likely an issue on the card, which isn't a huge surprise. But before getting into the weeds on this card, let's check out the IRM2. The IRM2 has a different design, but unfortunately, there's also a nickel cadmium battery that is leaked all over the PCB. We removed this battery as well, ran it through ultrasonic cleaning, and now it looks much better. Annoyingly, it has a different serial console pinout, so after adjusting that, we powered it up. and it sort of works. We're getting inconsistent console output, but eventually we do get to a menu. That success was short-lived though, as the card completely stopped working after this. We spent a decent amount of time troubleshooting the board. It was clear that the CPU's data bus was active, and we could see activity on the EEPROMs as well as our serial console inputs, making it all the way to the serial controller. After spending a whole day on it, we were unable to make any progress. With a schematic or theory of operation, that might have been a different story. So even without the IRM2 card working, we wanted to see if it could still function as a hub. We tested it out by connecting an uplink and a PC to the 10 base T card. Both ports got link lights and success. 
a ping is working and we do see some LED indication on the IRM2 card, but this is about as far as we can go without a working serial console. But that's okay because we've still got another chance. We have two eight slot chassis, one of which is empty and the other is fully populated. And these two units are quite different. The MMAC 8 FNB has the power input on the front, while the MMAC M8 FNB has power input directly on the PSU on the back. We think the M in the model name indicated enhanced management features compared to the standard MMAC 8 FNB. The manual indicates that certain power supplies could be monitored remotely, so the M8 FNB appears to be the newer and better unit. And we found an article about the M8 FNB from 1992, so that's probably around the time this updated chassis was released. And this chassis doesn't have an IRM card, but an eMME card, or Ethernet Management Module with Ethernet? The unit appears to be in much better condition, and this card has yet another type of serial console cable needed with an RJ45 connector. The pinout doesn't seem to match the Cisco style RJ45 style, so we hacked together a cable to try it out. We're connecting power to the single power supply installed on the back of the unit, which says it can draw up to 8 amps at 125 volts AC. After flicking on the power switch, the unit roars to life after a few seconds. It sounds good too, no strange fan noises from this one. Fortunately, we're greeted with serial console output, and we can see detailed output as it goes through power-up diagnostics and booting from flash. After about a minute, we see boot complete, and nothing else. We weren't immediately sure what the problem was. We checked the manual, which has instructions for using a physical VT320 terminal. It turns out the three wires, receive, transmit, and ground we connected so far were not sufficient to interact with the local management once it booted. We fixed this by adding the DSR and DTR wires following the pinout. We're now at a password prompt and the default password public isn't working. We tried out the reset button on the eMME, but found this just reboots the card. For the password issue, we pull out the card and flip up dip switch 8, and we're now able to log in with public. So we're resetting dip switch 8 back to its normal position. Looking at the menu, it's not really clear what we can do or want to do here, but let's see if we can actually use it to forward ethernet traffic. This unit arrived with these TP-MIM34 cards and one TPR-MIM36 card. We'll get into the difference between these cards later, but we can see they have CHAMP connectors also referred to as RJ21, which would have been used to connect to patch panels with RJ45 connectors. The connector has 50 pins and 10 base T used two pairs or four wires total. So you can see how each connector supported 12 ports. We're going to replace one of these cards with a TP-MIM24 card so that we can use RJ45 ports. We connected an uplink in our Ubuntu lab machine to two ports on the TP-MIM24 card. Both ports have link lights and we can successfully ping. Running ETH tool on Ubuntu shows our link is up at 10 megabits and half duplex. Looking now at the serial console, we can navigate to card 4 using the plus and minus keys, and then select different ports to see statistics on them. And while we're in here, let's also enable Telnet access to make it easier to manage. We do this by setting the IP address and net mask for use on our LAN. And with that saved, Telnet is now working. So what is the difference between our TP and TPR MIM cards? Checking the manual, it describes four Ethernet channels. The TP cards use Ethernet channel A on the MMAC backplane. The TPR cards have their own repeater functionality to use channels B and C, with channel D belonging to the AUI port on the eMME. These channels provide the ability to establish completely separate networks all on the same hub. And remember, this device predates VLANs for network segmentation. 
To manage these devices, Cabletron was very proud of its management suite called Spectrum, which was originally Unix-based and later was available for Windows as well. It had a hefty price tag, around $20,000 in 1992, then in later years reduced as we see it listed for $5,000 in their year 2000 catalog. And it looks like the Spectrum name lives on today as the DX Spectrum product from Broadcom, formerly CA Spectrum. Unfortunately, and unsurprisingly, we couldn't find a copy of Spectrum, but we can still use SNMP for monitoring. The manuals explain how to use SNMP and the management interface has an MIB Explorer tool. SNMP has been around since 1988 and is still in use today. So let's see what happens with trying to monitor this 30 year old network hub from a modern system. We're going to use Observium, a modern open source network monitoring system that supports a wide variety of devices. Still connected through the Cabletron, we're downloading it on our Ubuntu lab PC, which takes quite a while over a 10 megabit half duplex network connection. After extracting the tarball, we follow the install instructions. A few minutes later, we can now load the web interface and log in as the admin user. On the add device page, we're specifying the Cabletron's management IP, SNMP version one, and the SNMP community of public. We've got the device added now, but it hasn't been discovered or pulled yet. After waiting about 10 minutes, we can now see that Observium has pulled in some information about the Cabletron. On the ports listing, we can see four channels here, A, B, C, and D. Port A has some initial data showing up, but not yet enough to draw graphs. Monitoring the Cabletron wouldn't be very interesting without some real traffic, and we wanted to see what the maximum performance would be, at least for a single computer connecting to the Cabletron network. We're using iPerf3, a network performance tool used to measure the maximum bandwidth between two systems. We already have an iPerf3 server on our network, so we're starting up iPerf3 in client mode, which will transmit data to our server for 10 minutes. And in total, our average throughput was eight megabits per second, a little short of our theoretical maximum of 10 megabits per second. Now let's repeat the test, but in bi-directional mode where we transmit and also receive data from the iPerf3 server. As expected, we're seeing slower speeds due to the half duplex connection, meaning we cannot send and receive simultaneously. And our collision light seems to be even busier now. Refreshing the port view in Observium, we can now see data emerging on the graph from our test. Now let's take a look in real-time view as well, which is now polling every five seconds. The graph here is only inbound bandwidth, presumably because this data is for the entire channel A instead of an individual port. And it would be nice to be able to graph each port, but we couldn't find an easy way to get that set up here. All in all, our test was mostly a success. It's cool to see that even these relatively ancient devices can still be monitored today using modern tools. So what ended up happening with Cabletron? They suffered a similar fate as most of the other big four companies, which only Cisco has since avoided. Their enterprise network products like the MMAC were moved under the brand name of Enterasys in the year 2000 and their service provider products were spun out into Riverstone Networks. Testing out these Cabletron network hubs was a different experience than the newer managed switches that we're used to. It reminds us of just how different things were 30 years ago. For us, the Cabletron is a stepping stone to some even older networking technology that we're diving into for upcoming videos. Let us know in the comments if you've got any memories of Cabletron or what it was like setting up multimedia back in the day. Thanks for watching the Serial Port and we'll see you next time.